Hey folks, welcome to this episode on reaction evidence. So when we have matter, we can describe it in two different ways, the physical and the chemical characteristics. Uh, physical is something that you use your senses to describe, so color, uh, smell, taste, or we use measurements, in an example, density. Uh, chemical is describing how a substance actually reacts with another substance. So in this case, how it reacts in oxygen or how uh, a, a gasoline can uh, combust in oxygen. In this case, when we look at this apple, we can see that it's readily uh, reacting with oxygen to create this kind of brown skin. A physical change is a little bit different than a physical characteristic. Physical change uh, describes a change that does not produce a new substance. So you're actually changing the state or changing the form of the matter. Uh, now in this case, when we look at ice, ice is, uh, is an example of physical change because ice is just H2O in its solid form. And when it melts, you get H2O in its liquid form. Now you can see that both of them are H2O. There's not a difference in the chemical composition. There is a difference in the state or the way that we see it, the form, whatever, however you want to say it. But there is no difference in the chemical composition. This is a physical change. Same thing with this aluminum can. We can, we can crush the alumi aluminum can, but it still remains an aluminum can with this kind of plastic coating. The, that, that, com that chemical composition doesn't change. We've just decreased the volume. So examples of physical change is dissolving substances, melting, cutting, boiling, etc., etc. Most of these physical change can be reversed. For example, we can refreeze the water to create these ice cubes. Uh, if we try to stretch out this can, we can probably get something that's very close. Uh, we won't get it exactly perfect, but again, we'll still have an aluminum can that can hold some kind of liquid. A chemical change, on the other hand, is a reaction that produces a, a new substance with different properties. And that's the key, is that they're going to have different properties from the original substance. If we look at something like NaCl, just regular table salt, uh, this is produced from two elements, Na and Cl. Now, Na by itself is a metal that has to be stored in hexane because it's just so explosive. Uh, it, it easily reacts with oxygen, and if it comes into contact with water, it produces car uh, hydrogen gas, which can ignite. Chlorine is a gas that's used in, well, it was used in warfare uh, and also used in uh, pool treatments. So both of these things are, are very dangerous, highly toxic uh, in terms of the chlorine. But when we mix them together, we create this new NaCl that has this, these very, very uh, different, different properties. It's a solid still in terms of the metal, um, but it, it, it's an ionic compound and it has very docile properties. We actually need it to, for, for sustainment of life, at least the, um, the different um, ions, the electrolytes that, that, that are produced. So very different properties. Now one thing that these chemical changes uh, kind of, uh, they all kind of categorize in this, not all of them, but most of them can be very difficult to reverse and some of them you can't reverse at all. For example, once we cook this egg, we denature the proteins, okay, we get, we get into this. So once we denature those proteins, it's, we're not gonna be able to get back to the egg. So uh, most of them are very, very difficult to reverse if uh, reversible at all. Now you may have seen this demonstration before, a gummy bear putting into potassium chlorate. Um, and this, uh, this we use to try to figure out uh, what, are the, what are the clues of a chemical reaction. You can't actually see the chemical reaction occurring, but you can look at clues um, from that kind of reaction to see, uh, to make your mind up whether or not there was a, a reaction that took place. So in this reaction, we actually just put sugar uh, and potassium chlorate, uh, and we produce a kind of combustion reaction. Now, what clues of the chemical change can observe? Well, we can see a, a whole bunch of things at the bottom here. Um, we can see that there's light. We can also see that there's some kind of vapor produced. Hey, what that vapor is, well, we could figure that out a little bit later. Hey, there's going to be a change in volume. Uh, there might be a change in odor. There certainly would be a change in taste. Uh, so these are all different things that we can uh, try to figure out uh, if there, a chemical reaction happened or not. So there are five main indications uh, or indicators that a chemical reaction has occurred. Uh, an unexpected change in color. So here we have uh, two liquids. Uh, two colorless liquids, and when we mix them together, we get this yellow precipitate. Uh, change in odor, for example, uh, if you look at sweat, uh, sweat, you get, you get arm, arm odor or underarm odor. Um, that wasn't there when you first showered. So there, has, uh, there actually is a chemical reaction taking place in this area, and that's caused by the bacteria. Uh, they're, they're emitting an odor. Uh, production of new gases or vapor. So here we can see these little bubbles being created. Uh, that's an indicator of gases being formed. And we can also see this water vapor that wasn't there before. Uh, input or release of energy. Usually uh, the, chem the reactions that we're going to be studying are exothermic, which means that they're going to be releasing energy. Um, but this energy could be let off as heat. It could be let off as light. Um, so different forms of 
of energy being released. Now, they can also take in energy. Uh, you can have a chemical reaction and the resulting substance is going to be very, very cold. So that means it's endothermic. Uh, so as, as long as there's a change in ener energy, really, that's one of the indications that a chemical reaction has occurred. And the last one is a precipitated form. And this is a, a very, very good one. Uh, if, we form, if we see this kind of solid, uh, solid substance being formed in here, uh, then that's, a, that's a, a good indication that a chemical reaction has occurred. This is also precipitate over here, and you can see that they're, the particles are very, very small. As you leave them, they'll settle down to the bottom, you'll get a little bit more concentrated uh, solid at the bottom. So what do you think? Uh, take, a, take a moment and try to figure out which ones are which. Are these uh, physical changes or chemical changes? So pause the video, we'll come back, give you the answers. All right, so welcome back. Uh, here are the answers. Sugar dissolving in tea, uh, it's a physical change. We're simply breaking up the molecules uh, from one another, breaking those intermolecular forces, but the molecules themselves stay the same. Uh, breaking water up into hydrogen and oxygen gas. Well, here we're actually breaking apart the water molecule. So if we have uh, H2O, we're actually breaking up these bonds between the oxygens and the hydrogens, so we're actually completely breaking up the, the molecule. Uh, so that is a chemical change. Burning a log in a campfire. We're having a combustion reaction. Uh, in, or, in order to have something combust, you have to react it with oxygen. And that means that the chemical bonds between the uh, atoms and the molecules are also breaking. So that's a chemical, rea uh, chemical change. Crushing aspirin. All we're doing is we're physically changing it. Okay? So we're, we're just uh, going it from a more um, structured form to a more powdered form. But it's still going to be aspirin. If you take this or you take this, you're going to have the same effects in your body. Metal rusting, well, that's a chemical change. Again, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to reverse. If so, the, uh, a lot of the body shops would uh, have less money. Uh, but metal rusting is exposure to oxygen and moisture uh, and some electrolytes, and that's causing that uh, change in the metal. A lighter fluid burning, just like in the campfire, it's also going to be a chemical reaction because you're breaking the bonds between the molecules. An egg rotting, well, that's one indication, one of these things, if you think about an egg rotting, you get a change in odor. That's one of the indications, and again, different properties, etc., etc. Boiling water, all you're going is from liquid to gas, but it's still going to be H2O, so that's a physical change. Um, a lot of these, these uh, or not a lot, but some may release a type of gas, and so there are different, pro uh, different tests that we can use to identify what gas it is, and that's because these gases have different properties. So there are various tests, and we're going to talk about those in a second. So here are our different properties. Um, you can see that the first three are, are very interesting because they're all very similar properties in terms of our physical properties, the colors and odorless. So how do we know which ones are which? For oxygen, we're going to place a glowing splint into the uh, test tube containing the gas. Now, if this, um, if this glowing splint relights, so again, a glowing splint doesn't have a flame, it's just kind of the, uh, the orange embers. If that relights, then we're in the presence of oxygen. Remember, oxygen can cause combustion. It's one of the necessary three things that, uh, for fire. So uh, it will relight. Hydrogen, if you put a uh, lit splint into uh, a test tube containing hydrogen, you're going to hear this kind of like, or pop, uh, and that will indicate to the presence of hydrogen. Carbon dioxide um, and ammonia are interesting. If you put a uh, lit splint into either one of these, um, either one of the ammonia or the carbon dioxide, both of them will actually extinguish the flame. So it's not a, a definite, uh, it's not a definite um, test for, either, for, for carbon dioxide. So a better test for carbon dioxide is actually passing this gas through something called lime water or calcium hydroxide. And when you do so, if you look on the side here, this is just clear calcium hydroxide, uh, right here, calcium hydroxide. And as we pass uh, carbon dioxide through it, it becomes more milky. So a positive test is the lime water turning more milky. Uh, ammonia, if you hold a lit uh, litmus paper, a moist one, okay, uh, you will be able to um, get a, an, an indication as the litmus tape paper turns blue. Uh, it also, an interesting thing is that if you, if you have ammonia in the presence of hy uh, hydrochloric acid, uh, it will also allow you to see if ammonia is present because you'll create something called ammonium chloride, which is this kind of um, uh, thin white smoke. And it's actually a solid. Uh, but it's so light that uh, it, it kind of turns into a smoke. So if you see, if you put those two together, the vapors intertwine, form ammonium chloride, and you can also see a positive test for uh, ammonia. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. See you next time.